further ado, I hope you enjoy my friend Kyle has a brain tumor. Good evening. Is there anybody here willing and able to assist me with my performance this evening? Yeah. 
I wanted to be careful concerning what I would say about Kyle, so I wrote a script. A script is one way to be full of care, I suppose, or so I've written. I recognized Kyle had some reservations about being represented by someone other than himself, even if it was me, his friend, Benjamin Ross Nicholson. He was worried I might get it wrong and lead you to believe things about him that he doesn't believe. After sharing with him the song you just heard, he asked me to avoid depicting him in any way that might seem melodramatic or theatrical. (laughs) Specifically, he asked me to remove a lyric that suggested he was lonely because he is not in a relationship. To the extent anyone might know of such things, Kyle would prefer the following to be known. He is not lonely, but rather he's undertaking a reassessment of what love might mean to him. In an attempt to include Kyle in the process of the production of this performance, I've asked him to annotate this script as so as to provide additional context, augmentation, and rebuttal to what I've prepared. From this moment forward, I will read his annotations aloud on his behalf. Now allow me to step into the dark, so to speak, so that you may enjoy an image in my visual absence. Of this, Kyle writes, assuming I've moved from this projector's light into a somewhat darkened space, and that there's something sad about that. Uh Uh-oh, he's now out of love. Save him. Throw him a raft. Ben, are you okay? (laughs) The image before you. This is a recent instance of Kyle's art. Let's notice what we see. The art includes a dead fish, a symbol that has appeared in at least one other of his works. There are French words which I will pronounce badly using an index card prepared by my partner who is conversant in French. (laughs) Tout ce qui est, mais n'est pas, c'est l'amour. I'll provide a translation in a moment. If you don't speak French, allow yourself to remain curious about the significance of this phrase. A price tag is represented in the corner, $3.99 American. A small man is hacking his way into the bowels of the fish. Or alternatively, a normal-sized man is hacking his way into the bowels of a large fish. There's a tree in the background that might appear lonely, but is unlikely to be experiencing the sensation of loneliness. It's reacting to its environment more slowly than we can perceive. To this, Kyle writes, some trees are bigger than others. I'll allow you a few more moments with the image of this artwork before we proceed. This image was provided to me by Kyle, though he can't claim total responsibility for its existing. Paul Gauguin carved the wood panel here in 1889. Meanwhile, Kyle contributed the various labels and indicative lines, which, when read as an ordered list, appear to be missing item F. Perhaps this designation was intended for, but ultimately withheld from the unlabeled positive affirmation about love, which points to this French text here which we'll discuss in a moment. Uh, It's the title of Gauguin's piece. You see, if you recall the preceding image that included the either oversized dead fish or undersized hacker man, Kyle has underlined oversized dead fish and written this one, so we know where he stands on this debate. Kyle has designed to generate a series of nine panels derived from the features of Gauguin's work. The labels and indicative lines are Kyle's attempt to systematize the visual elements that will be represented on each panel. Now, why was Kyle so impressed by this relief? Soyez amoureux, vous serez heureux, though poorly pronounced, is what Kyle would call a positive affirmation about love. Again, it's also the title of Gauguin's wood panel. As mentioned, Kyle has become fascinated by the notion of love of late given that French is off-cited as the language of love, not to be confused with the love languages, which include words of affirmation, quality time, physical touch, acts of service, and receiving gifts, 
it is perhaps unsurprising that Kyle would explore French musings that are largely unintelligible to him without translation. And what do Gauguin's words signify in our less lovely English? <coughs> According to Google Translate, soyez amoureuse, vous serez amoureuse, means be in love and you will be happy. Superficially, this sounds like a simple equation. Kyle writes, walk on over and be in, presumably love. That is to say, finding one's way to happiness, the pursuit of which is nominally an inalienable right, merely involves some immersion in love. I wager that Kyle received this premise somewhat ironically. According to the Wikipedia page for Gauguin's piece, the title is somewhat ironic and probably stems from the same dark, bitter humor that led him, Gauguin, to title his home the House of Pleasure. In fact, the work's subject matter is bleak and its mood turbulent. It represents an exploration of corruption, lust, voyeurism, and male sexual power. In the early winter of 2018, following the completion of our MFA program in Chicago, in visual art, if you can believe it, Kyle came to stay at 1261 West Granville Avenue, where I lived with my then fiance, now ex-wife, who we will call Hilda for privacy reasons. <laughs> Kyle and I were both adjunct teaching introductory art classes in the building at the school from which we received our graduate degrees, an opportunity offered to our cohort of eight art students in the year following our graduation. Kyle had relocated to Denver, Colorado, to finally cohabitate with his long-term partner, who he had been seeing long distance for years. We'll call her Dina for privacy reasons. This is to say Kyle moved to Colorado, a place to which he had no other ties to be with Dina, who had moved there following nursing school, to be in love and thus happy. Things were not going well in their household. Kyle would explain the situation to my now ex-wife Hilda and me, and we would provide our expert relationship advice. <laughs> Kyle and Dina were in an open relationship so as to be able to experience love equally with multiple partners. Of these multiple partners, Kyle writes, I didn't expect these people to exist for me when I started. I was right. Kyle was willing to participate, but only felt capable of love for Dina. Kyle writes, I was willing to participate, yeah, but it was a mutual decision that had been made at the beginning of the relationship. I didn't have a word for it then. This is the word he came up for, with to describe his feelings about the relationship. Compersion, achieving happiness through your partner's happiness. We used the typical text to bring in some vocab that might help, but we're never to we never truly landed on a title. I think open was used most, not sure. The level of idealism we had carried us through, and still today I don't have any regrets about that part of our relationship. It honestly never got in the way. However, Hilda and I felt that this incongruence represented an existential threat to their romantic domestic relationship. Kyle was convinced it could work, and being long distance again while he taught in Chicago and lived with Hilda and I for about three months, it seemed like he was more comfortable with Dina than he had been in Colorado with her persistent presence, where her relative absence was more notable and more implicating of her relative feelings for him. Kyle writes, persistent presence, non-presence, yeah, her body was home, but she wasn't communicating anymore. All that was gone. Kyle told us that Dina wanted him to be friends with one of her other partners and had introduced them at a private, private dinner between the three of them. Kyle corrects this factual inaccuracy by stating, ha, she was having anxiety attacks when I asked to meet him. I did a few times. I bought him some beers at a hole in the wall. Dina never made it. The writing was on the wall for both of uh, he and I. I think she realized she actually wanted to be alone for the first time. I was 29, she was 25. Kyle expressed that he found the guy to be nice and fine. When Kyle returned to Denver, Dina continued to see, but soon ended her relationship with the other guy. Kyle writes, forgot his name, he was bummed from what I heard. I mean, yeah, I was about to be similarly bent out of shape, so I felt bad for him. Kyle felt this was a harbinger of her desire to end her relationship with him as well, which she did rather promptly after having been with Kyle for six years. I 
believe this experience impacted Kyle's sense of love as a conduit for happiness. Kyle writes, it did, but like almost everything we did together, it was beautiful. The quiet, though, that's what sticks still. It was when questions went forever unanswered. We stopped having sex, and somewhere in a low, both naked in the shower moment of us crying, me, because I thought she was withholding the key directions to her head. I had tried everything I could think of for about a year, and she, I think, because she didn't want to hurt me and she was lost too, she realized she could be lost and happy alone. That way she wouldn't feel the guilt I must have presented for her as I was slowly losing my mind from sitting in the metaphorical dark. We ended it. She got there and ended it. So we went and cried through a bottle of wine and a plate of pasta in public, and then planned a road trip. We rode together for a week-long camping music festival at the Gorge in Washington. Again, absolutely beautiful companionship. When we were almost back to Denver is the only time in which emotions percolated up. I went for a run, unrelatedly fell and got all cut up, came back to the car looking as emo as humanly possible. I don't think we talked about the fall. We were both still mad, actually. Kyle further writes, I read Martha Nussbaum in grad school to try to understand this phenomenon. Not the loss of high motor skills while angry or sad, but because of the duality of emotion that can manifest when you are in anguish. I used to talk about it in Chicago using an example of analyzing yourself crying while crying. In this case, I remember the ground gave out below my feet in what looked like a plane of medium-sized stones stacked in plateaus. So, Kyle writes, Kyle, running, angry, fall, immediate thoughts, you're an idiot, Kyle, laugh, but still angry. Returning to Kyle's art, we recall another French phrase, this time of Kyle's making. Tout ce qui est, mais n'est pas, c'est l'amour. This translates roughly to, all that is, but is not, is love. All that is, but is not, is love. There's a few ways we can parse this premise, and given Kyle's fascination with logic, we will do so logically using everyone's favorite programming language, Java. We can consider if a thing is, if it exists, and determine if that same thing simultaneously is not, if it does not exist. And whichever thing satisfies both conditions constitutes love. If we imagine existing and not existing to be mutually exclusive categories, then common sense would suggest that there is no such thing for which both of these conditions are true. Thus, nothing, no thing, is love. Love does not exist. Alternatively, we could consider if a thing is, if it exists, at some point in time, and determine if that same thing is not, if it does not exist at some other point in time, and whichever thing satisfies both conditions constitutes love. If we imagine the preemptive and eventual not existing of all forms that can be said to exist, if we foreclose the possibility of immortality as a foundational premise of our being, which I must concede not everyone is willing to do, then we arrive at a conclusion that directly contradicts our previous determination. Everything, everything is love. Love flows through all such things that exist and, accordingly, are impermanent. Given the potential for disagreement on what constitutes existence, this seems to be an irresolvable state of affairs. And this is before we've even addressed what love might signify vis-a-vis -vis existing. In short, Kyle's art offers us no destination, nowhere to park our love. We might then consider for a moment one of Kyle's early tattoos received during his undergraduate days, which is similarly revealing of how Kyle's presence absence might relate to the possible presence absence of love as it may be found in things. Always bleeding, not quite bleeding, but practically so. Kyle told me recently that in most photographs taken of him as a child, he could be seen covered in cuts and bruises and dirt. Kyle writes, I had a nickname at such a young age that it was gone before I was six or so, Dr. Dent. He spent much of his time speeding around, colliding with things, joyfully, I believe. 
As a young adult, Kyle was still known for his tendency to become injured and to honor this tendency was punctured by a needle, inappropriately labeled. To always be bleeding could be understood as oxymoronic, for to bleed continuously without cessation implies that no coagulation of the blood occurs and, as in the case of hemophiliacs, risks causing a death by exsanguination. In this scenario, always is cut short, further resulting in the cessation of Kyle's body's ability to produce new blood to be bled. Of course, it's possible that some procedure could be undertaken to periodically reopen a wound that would otherwise heal to continue the bleeding, leading to a minimum of blood loss, but, unless done under highly controlled and sterile conditions, might cause infection, which also could lead to death and the same cessation of the production of blood mentioned previously. If we accept always and bleed in metaphorically, however, we might get some sense of an existence steeped in dual processes of loss, bleed in, in the ongoing generation and accretion of form and being that allows for there to be something to lose in the first place, so long as one exists in the seeming always of livelihood. Again, with Kyle, we find little resolution, only a certain sort of circularity that keeps us moving until we stop. You see this panel, Kyle's art. Do you recall that Kyle took direction from Gauguin? I must now reveal that Kyle has been looking at a lot of art and has no problem putting it to use. Of this, Kyle writes, note. This is a 1556 brush and pen drawing by Flemish artist Bruegel the Elder, titled Big Fish Eat Little Fish. Under this, Kyle has written, now dead fish. <laughs> and this is a 1557 engraving of Bruegel the Elders drawn by Peter van der Hayden, signed erroneously in the lower left-hand corner with the name Hieronymus Bosch, an artist who died in 1516. Hieronymus Bosch made paintings that looked like this. This, Kyle writes, eating a human. The van der Heyden etching contains two lines of text. The first, in Latin, translates to indicate that big fish are small fish, or that big fish exist by virtue of their consumption of smaller fish, that is to say, they are what they eat. The second line, in Flemish, reads in English as, See, son, this I have known for a very long time, that those big fish eat the small ones. I would like to note that this reference to generational relations, a father and son, is fascinating. We will discuss this soon. More recently, the cheerful British band Radiohead leveraged the premise, this premise, in the lyrics to their song Optimistic. It is tempting to interpret such fish talk as commentary on the nature of power, that to be big is to be stronger than, to be small is to be weaker than, and that the prerogative of the big is to subject the small to every manner of exploitation, deprivation, and violence so long as it might maintain or enhance the girth of the mighty. Yet, if we think about the is and isn't of things, love, blood, and even fish, we might also understand something of what it means to contain. That to be a container for something usually means to supply ample space for such a thing to be surrounded, to have a place, to be placeable, to belong, to have meaning. Our bodies, to the extent we recognize them anatomically, offer a recursive series of containments that, per the science of biology, are necessary in order to permit the ongoingness of our species. Our skin surfaces the general structure of our forms. Our torsos contain our hearts, amongst other wet things. Our hearts contain our atria, which are responsible for our blood's containment of oxygen in collaboration with the lungs. They say love is a matter of the heart. Is love somewhere in there? And if love is in the heart, is it because it has been eaten? Does love involve devouring? At the cusp of time between 2016 and 2017, Kyle's father, who had been missing, was found dead in California. Kyle writes, in one of the Santas. 
Kyle was working on his MFA thesis show and created this object, an arch of bass rising from and descending into the ostensible sea, offering the illusion of some kind of continuity of feasting animals, but literally terminating at the floor. This art, art, art object was a component of a larger installation and series of three videos depicting friends and acquaintances of Kyle's trying to explain Kyle's project. A thesis exhibition whose images Kyle insisted I include to demonstrate that he had mustered more than a single arch of bass for Carl, his father. He actually made two arches of bass. Kyle writes, too, whoa. The audience successfully understands the compulsion Kyle had to make art about a topic that tested the knockoff stoicism he had adopted. The exhibition looked like this. Regardless of the number of arches of bass Kyle produced, the symbolism is clearly of significance to Kyle, whose Instagram handle is fish eating fish, and who has labored to share with us this art. This time, I would like to provide you with the opportunity to encounter a sensual experience. Would anyone like to hold it? Please take good care of Kyle's panel until the end of the show, at which point I will come to collect it. You are welcome to share it with those you love or may come to love. <laughs> Though the preceding moments of this performance can be said to have constituted act one of my friend Kyle has a brain tumor, we slipped just moments ago and perhaps without realizing it into what we might call act two of the show. The introductory song, act one, and a concluding outro, which you have yet to witness, were piloted at an event in Los Angeles in the last days of April of this year as part of an end of semester show put on my by my department at the University of Southern California, where I am a PhD candidate in the Media Arts and Practice program. You may find yourself asking, Benjamin Ross Nicholson, if you're a grad student at USC, what are you doing here in Denver, Colorado? I will explain this soon. For now, let it remain as mysterious as French aphorisms to a monolingual English speaker. Now, Kyle, at this point, learned I was going to be performing this show on three consecutive nights and was really alarmed by the idea that I had to do this more than once. He writes here, three nights in a row, you will stand and present our dirty laundry to empty seats. He assumed there would be mostly empty seats, which to be fair, there are some. You revel in the awkwardness of it, don't you? I assume you have played out a scenario where you are there looking out at only one other set of eyes. In the fantasy, you insist on performing the entirety of the show. It is romantic, and you go to shake the audience member's hand. The poor victim has to pee so badly, though, that all they can offer you is a clammy clap. And then, anticipating that this would be the scenario I would encounter, Kyle writes in encouragement, ride high, red man, ride. Kyle came with me to Los Angeles to observe the performance. Our intention was to get the show on its feet, so to speak, and determine what of the 35-minute show, Kyle's crossed out show and written skit, 
might be retained for Denver Fringe, and what might be augmented to achieve a roughly 60 minute runtime. Kyle writes, we should be aiming for 132 minutes, the length of John Carter, directed by Andrew Ayers Stanton. John Carter, the panned Disney movie, is Kyle's favorite movie. What you are witnessing now at this very moment is a portion of that augmentation. This follows from our time in Los Angeles. Though Kyle's Western adventures could be elaborated at length, as Kyle was in quite a state of excitement and stimulation, resulting in some notable behavioral expressions. Of this, Kyle writes, Andrew Ayers Stanton did not direct Kung Fu Panda. We will focus only on a certain art object that was created as an offshoot of the performance from a pulpy slurry of dead trees fluidified and the person to whom that art object led Kyle. But first, an anecdote from my wedding. On the morning of August 4th, 2018, a previously unanticipated rainstorm appeared to be consolidating its efforts over Mount Hope Farm in Bristol, Rhode Island. Hilda had decided the day before to rush order some 50 clear plastic umbrellas for our guests, which, as of the morning in question, hadn't arrived, and which, until just months ago, had sat in my mother's New Hampshire garage, that she had only been able to generously pawn off about 20 to friends and family in the interceding years. She recently had the remainder taken away. Calling the vendor, we found out that the umbrellas were being held at a FedEx facility across the border in Massachusetts and were not going to be able to be delivered in time for the wedding. Kyle, my de facto best man, though he insisted that I not refer to him as such, Kyle writes a grossly open display of my avoidance of obligations. I had done it once previous and felt so sick about it that I couldn't risk having that feeling repeated. And I determined at 8 a.m. that we would head out to Massachusetts to retrieve the umbrellas. Along the roughly 90 minute drive, we decided to stop for breakfast in a manner that would have never been approved by Hilda had she been with us. Without consulting Yelp for its recommendations of quality, we were going to pull our car over to the first restaurant we saw that appeared to be open and eat there. I don't recall the name of the place we chose, but I can briefly describe it to you. <laughs> Dimly lit, long and narrow, smelling of burnt cooking oil. Kyle writes, a church's kitchen. We took stool seats at the counter, we were the only guests when we arrived, and were met by an exhausted looking woman returning from smoking cigarettes out back. She took our orders. I may have had a grilled cheese sandwich. I'm not sure about Kyle. He writes, I'm thinking a Reuben and proceeded to pour us water as perhaps an orange juice. A man with a limp arrived soon after, apparently the person responsible for making the food, and was told what we had ordered. Once our food was in front of us, the man and the woman forgot about Kyle and me and spoke to one another at like characters out of Manchester by the Sea, Goodwill Hunting, The Town, or any number of other Affleck-affiliated films set near Boston. Now may I ask for a pair of volunteers to perform a dramatic reading of their interaction fictionalized in these pages, but retaining the essence of New England beleaguerment we encountered that day nearly four years ago. <laughs> One more? Yeah, you guys come on up. So I have scripts for both of you. Um, you're gonna be Sally. You're gonna be Sal. Uh, allow me to read the title and the italicized stage directions. Um, you, as Sally, will not read the word Sally, but just the words after Sally, colon, your lines, as with you for Sal. Um, so step into the diner. <laughs> Introduce your performance. A New England Breakfast by Benjamin Ross Nicholson. Sal and Sally stand behind the counter as two oblivious customers eat their barely prepared food. Sally sighs completely and addresses Sal in a deeply affected New England accent. How's it hanging, Sal? <laughs> Sal responds without much enthusiasm. Not so good, Sally. I think it's getting worse. Certainly not getting any better. I don't know how much I've got left. How's Salem hanging? She's hanging in there, has a busted hoof, but she can still eat. Not so from, not so different from you, huh, Sal? Yep. Yep. I could use a butt. I think we've been here long enough. Sal and Sally leave the restaurant to the customers, thinking it unlikely that they will steal anything. 
Thank you. This is my favorite memory from my wedding day. Returning to the Los Angeles of this past April, though we were staging a performance of this play, the main event that my department hosted was an exhibition of art installations. Kyle and I wanted to make something more physical that we could exhibit, which would allude to the premises with which we had been so engaged in this play. Ephemerality, love, dying, sharing, and the materiality of the generation and mutation of art objects. Kyle had been experimenting with using molds to cast paper into debossed images. The process worked like this. And note, we did not take any pictures during the event, so the images you are about to see are approximations. Kyle stacked and secured two three-quarter inch squares of MDF board. Using a CNC router, an image was engraved into the MDF. A wall was built around the engraved MDF form and liquid rubber was poured onto it, solidifying into a mold that held the image in negative. Plaster was then poured into the rubber mold, solidifying, reversing the image once more. Kyle brought his mold to Los Angeles, whereupon we required material to cast into it. We searched the campus and the house of my friend Fidelia, uh, who's also a classmate and who was putting us up for our stay, for paper. We tore the paper into thin scraps and used a ninja blender to mix the paper scraps with water and slice them into a fibrous slurry. As this blending operation was somewhat last minute, it was performed in one of the bathrooms of USC's School of Cinematic Arts, the noise alarming undergraduates as they walked by and generally causing them to avoid entering the bathroom. <laughs> we funneled the slurry and additional water into a black plastic trash can until the slurry had the appropriate consistency and set up a table outside of the exhibition space to greet attendees and offer them pre-made prints or the opportunity to make their own. To make each print, Kyle would dip a mesh sieve into the bucket of wet gray pulp and lift up a dripping clump of material, which he then pressed against the sieve with a cloth to wring out some of the water. This plane of paper fiber was then scraped off onto the plaster mold, a paintbrush applied to drive the paper into the mold's recessed image. Several layers of paper would be applied to thicken the print, then a wooden board would be pressed against the paper, pushing it tightly against the mold. Once enough material had been assembled and the wet paper fibers had bound to one another sufficiently, Kyle would peel the print off the mold and place it on a rack to dry. For a little extra pizzazz, we also collected a stack of USC's student newspapers, the Daily Trojan, from which we extracted colorful images that could be applied to the mold prior to the paper pulp and thus become the face of the print after drying. We also found a pile of Valentine's Day themed napkins sitting in a box of refuse at Fidelia's apartment. These will come to be important later. Kyle writes, from that stash, I also found a nearly used important financial documents belonging to Fidelia. If I'm not mistaken, the prints we made, soon to be embarrassingly shown, were on the precipice of costing Fidelia almost $700. Following the truncated version of this show's performance, guests were asked to migrate to the exhibition space where Kyle and I were set up to make prints and assist folks in making their own. Here is an example of one of the resulting objects. Though it may be difficult to read in this image, a keen eye will notice the following French text. You can see some of the ridges of that text kind of popping up around here. <clears throat> La naissance du plaisir. In English, as always, the birth of pleasure. Given the DIY quality of the production process, these prints were what you might consider to be poor objects. They were fragile, often incomplete as chunks of paper pulp would be torn away during the print's transfer from the mold to the drying rack. In March of 2020, I was in Los Angeles, and Hilda, my then wife, had been living and working in New York City for about nine months, the first time we had been apart in the over 11 years of our relationship and nearly two years of marriage. 
Kyle, with a certain amount of disapproval, writes, why? The definition of codependence. What drives your fascination for your partner? A novel coronavirus had infiltrated human populations around the globe and various municipalities, including Los Angeles and New York City, were about to go into lockdown. Hilda already had plans to come to Los Angeles for my birthday, April 2nd, about two weeks out. On a phone call, I suggested that she just stay with me in Los Angeles after her visit, given that she would be working her data science job remotely for the foreseeable future anyway. That is to say, we could ride out the pandemic together as partners. Kyle writes as happily married people. She told me that she didn't think she wanted to come to LA. I asked what she meant if she was worried about traveling with so much uncertainty concerning infection. She said that wasn't the issue, she just didn't want to come to LA, ever. I reminded her that I lived in LA. She said she knew this. After hanging up in a stillness of disbelief, I felt my phone vibrate. Kyle was sending a message to me and Shauna, another of our Chicago MFA classmates, in a group text thread, something silly and casual. So Kyle actually went back in his phone and looked at what he was texting me while this was happening. Uh, this is the verbatim text that he had sent. When I'm still in bed in the morning, I feel like touching my face a thousand times to get it out of my system. He also sent a picture of himself. He writes of this, Then I sent a selfie I had taken the day prior. It had been made for a woman who I knew in college. I hadn't spoken to her in years and had never spoken to her one-on-one. -on -one. She was actually the good friend of my then-girlfriend. This is 2007. She had dropped out. Her younger brother had been hunting in the woods with their father when a tree fell, struck the young man, and killed him. It was when the schools closed during the pandemic that she started calling me. Perplexed is an understatement for how I felt. I assumed, like many others, she was isolated and running down old leads. Why I ended up on her list is a question I don't care to pursue. The selfie I sent Ben and Shauna and this previous acquaintance was marked the last correspondence her and I had. I was sending it to Ben and Shauna seeking somebody's approval since I hadn't received any from its original receiver. So after receiving this from Kyle, I texted them, Kyle and Shauna, that Hilda wanted to separate. Kyle told me to pack up my things and drive to Denver to stay with him. That's why I came here, and that's why I returned to Los Angeles only seldomly. I'm working on my dissertation now. I'm allowed to be in the wind. Kyle's invitation to come to Colorado preceded a series of events that I won't recall here. After all, this is a show about Kyle and his brain tumor not my failed suicide attempt in my meeting of Gabby, my partner of over two years, during a 72-hour hold in the behavioral unit of Boulder Community Health on April 9, 2020. I will only note the reciprocal quality of my invitation to Kyle to join me for a weekend in LA and its impact on his circumstances. Perhaps we should all invite each other on journeys more often. Kyle writes, my reaction to the inclusion of this paragraph in the last two pages is difficult to translate into the margins of this script. On further inspection, dot, dot, dot. And he writes, no more here. Back to Los Angeles. In order to provide prospective print recipients with a sense of what they would be getting, Kyle decided to prepare a couple of test prints in advance. One was unadorned with any imagistic newsprint, a gray sludge that would desiccate into a brittle shard. The other was surfaced with one of the Valentine's Day napkins. You've seen an image of this print, which also included a red paper napkin from the catering service that fed the event's attendees. In the early hours of the exhibition, Kyle facilitated the generation of about six prints for individual guests or small groups of friends. As the evening darkened, we packed up our printing station and moved our materials into the exhibition space to store for the evening. Though the event was about to shut down, Fidelia, who was also exhibiting work, let us know we would only return to her place after her ex-roommate stopped by. We will call her Johanna for privacy reasons. Johanna and Fidelia had lived together for several years but had recently parted ways domestically. However, they were still friends and Johanna wanted to check out Fidelia's work. She eventually arrived with another friend of hers. For Kyle, it was love at first sent. 
on the unresolvable terms of fluid, fleshy bodies and the sensations of experience to which they give rise. In the proximity that comes with those moments of introduction, Kyle noticed he wanted to know her better. Upon being asked what he was doing in Los Angeles, Kyle went to fetch one of the demonstration prints, the one that was slowly dehydrating as napkin and paper pulp fibers fused. Upon seeing it, Johanna was slightly taken aback. The pattern on the surface of the print was identical to a set of Valentine's Day napkins Johanna's mother had sent her in February. Johanna's mother was and remains in the habit of sending Johanna disposable napkins on holidays. We gradually pieced together that Johanna, not holding the napkins in particularly high regard, had allowed the napkins to be packed away with other items that Fidelia had been moving out of their previously shared living space, and that Kyle and I had, in a moment of serendipity, discovered them when we were searching Fidelia's new apartment for art materials. This coincidence offered ample opportunity for subtle bewilderment and communion. While Fidelia and I returned to the apartment to sleep, Kyle re-entered the Los Angeles night to join Johanna and her friends in a punk rock bar. To this, Kyle writes, we, with an exclamation point. As to the whereabouts of the print, I have nothing to reveal to you, nothing for you to touch. Kyle writes, not that you would want to. To give it to you how it was would be to give you a wet ornament of trash. Kyle gave the print to Johanna, who has since lost it. Kyle writes, maybe? It is it's, it in itself means little. The relationship that has arisen is like the paper. It is made by interwoven fibers of correspondence. Each note of the whole plays a role in making a blurry image. If re-wet or torn, the pieces become as useful as they were previously yet are stained from being handled. So yeah, life. Though Kyle and I have since returned to Colorado, Johanna and Kyle continue to correspond persistently. There's no plan between Kyle and Johanna, no teleology of romantic partnership to be achieved. Rather, they are in touch without touching at a geographic remove. Anything can happen, though nothing is guaranteed. I've written a brief song about their relationship, a sort of bookend to the song I performed earlier in this show. With the word bookend, Kyle writes, it's got to be insanely frustrating that I haven't died yet. Call HBO, get somebody to wrap this thing up. Adding my death to the narrative could sap the perspective of the moving subject, which is not Kyle and his brain tumor. The subject, as far as I can tell, is the open relationship shared by Kyle, me, and Ben, the guy likely in shorts and tall socks who is reading these words. I've decided to title the song The Ballad of Kyle and Johanna for now, though this may change someday, as words do. For the sake of intimacy, this song will not be accompanied by a display of its lyrics. I will try to enunciate, and will ask you to listen intently. I believe this will bring us closer. <laughs> Kyle writes, don't get too close, people, otherwise risk becoming the next amputated voice represented by pencil scrawlings in the margins of a script. <laughs> No. 
Speaking of touching, of being in touch, I would like to perform a brief shadow play to demonstrate what it's like trying to reach out to Kyle by phone. May I have one last volunteer? <laughs> this one's easy, all you have to do is stand still. So come right here, turn around. Move a little bit this way. A little bit closer. Put your arm straight out to your side, palm facing forward. Just this one arm. Put it down. Walk to your left. A little less. A little more this way. A little bit down. Perfect. Perfect. A little bit back. Right there. As you can see, our shadows converge, but do not touch. We can each reach a bit further and unite the image of our arms, but it would be difficult to, to discern from only our shadows whether we, or not we are actually touching or just passing each other by. This is what it's like trying to reach out to Kyle by phone. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to try to call Kyle now. Sometimes he picks up and sometimes he doesn't. He knows that this show is happening and he knows, given that he has read and annotated the script, that I will try to call him. This does not guarantee that he will answer even though he loves me. If he does answer, I will greet him and then ask you, comrades, if there's anything you'd like to say to Kyle, anything you'd like to ask him. If he does not answer, I will announce myself to his voicemail and then ask you, Comrades, if there's anything you'd like for Kyle to know about how you feel. As voicemail messages are time limited, we may need to make several calls to say all that needs to be said. I'll have my phone on speaker, though you might want to lean forward in your seats. Hi Kyle, this is Ben. We're at the show. Uh, most of the audience, I don't believe, knows that you're in Thailand right now, but given the uh, path through to your voicemail, they may know now. So, in lieu of being able to talk to you, thought we might let a few folks just tell you how they're feeling about things. Does anyone want to share something that they're feeling?
So Kyle, Gabby's mom, Imelda, would like to, uh, for you to send pictures. <laughs> Does anyone else have something they'd like to share with Kyle? Why is he in Thailand? Gabby's cousin would like to know, <laughs> to ask you why you're in Thailand. So think about that. <laughs> Can we have one more? thought or comment or question for Kyle. Becky. How does does Kyle feel having a show all about him? Becky would like to know how you feel having a show all about you. Kyle, I think we've found the last of our time and we have to go. We love you. Thank you.